right, so I'm operating under the assumption, uh, which I believe is probably a correct one today, that this is likely the last place any of you really want to be right now, right? <laughs> you know, it's, it's the, the last day before break. Um, you know, uh, we're, uh, you know, it's been a long term. Everybody's tired. Um, so here's what we're going to do, right? Um, here's the uh, assignment for over the break, right? You're just going to read chapter 90, writing analytically, which is about how to conduct research. When you come back, we're going to do a research day. And then uh, you're going to re uh, complete reflection paper 8 over the break as well. Right? Same rules as all other reflection papers. Everything is otherwise more or less the same. So does anybody have any questions about anything that's coming up? Okay, so all we're gonna have all we're gonna have you do today, right? I'm just gonna have you do a free write on the Terry Tempest Williams piece. We'll talk a little bit about what you wrote, and then I'll let everybody go, okay? So here's the thing I want you to consider, right? I want you to find a quote with strong Symbolic or metaphorical resonance, right? Where you think Williams is using um, symbolism or metaphor to illustrate a particular concept and then try to unpack it, right? Take it apart. Explain the symbol. Explain the metaphor. Explain to me what's going on there. All right, so you have 12 minutes to do this, and then we'll discuss. Uh, it starts on uh, 256. This is, this is what we're working on right now, just doing a 12 minute free write.
that off of um, Yeah, yeah, use the, the Terry Tempest Williams. Okay. Let's say. Yep. Yeah, if I find a symbol or a metaphor, yeah, and, uh, and sort of explain what you think it means. Yep. yep. Something that has a deeper meaning. Exactly.
two more minutes, everybody. Okay, so that's time. So what y'all come up with? Who, uh, who is uh, willing to go first here? Don't all jump up at once. Okay. All right, thank you, Chris. So I pulled like the very last short paragraph at the end of it. Okay. Where she's talking about how um, it says about the officials thought it was a cool joke to leave them stranded in the desert uh -huh. and no way to get home, but they didn't realize it that they were home. Uh huh. And so I talked about how. Um, they thought um, it was just like a desolate, barren, unhappy place because yeah. they didn't know anything about it because they didn't come from it. Yeah, that's actually a really good connection there, right? Yeah, they, what do we know about these officials that are running the nuclear site? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not local. Yeah. They don't know the place and they don't care about it, right? Exactly, but to them it was everything they'd ever known. And they had all the smells and stuff of it and all the memories of where they yeah. The officials did have that. Uh huh. Yeah. So we've got this idea of inside and outside here, right? Yeah, basically. Yeah, and she kind of she takes it, like she takes the way it's set up and kind of inverts it, right? So what's inside the barrier, right, is what the officials control. But the insiders are really the outsiders here because the officials don't know anything about the land. The land. Yeah. They just think it's just like a desert, basically. Yeah. Just like this mm -hmm. desert place. Yeah, I mean that this, this desert place that it was okay to drop nuclear fallout on, right? Yeah, because they didn't say anything about or appreciate the land like yeah. the rest of them did some sort of raise there. Yeah, no value in it yeah. for them, right? And I, I want to point to a phrase that they use on page 257. She says, they like the, in this kind of official terminology, it's referred to as low use segments of the population. Now, I want you to just kind of pay attention to the specific phrasing here, right? Is it low use or no use? Or 
Page 257, yeah. Yeah, so if they were calling it a low use segment of the population, right? What does that indicate they know about it, even as they're dropping fallout on it? There are people there, but not a lot. Yeah, that people do live here, right? Yeah, but there's not a lot of them. Yeah. There is. Yeah, a lot of use segments of the population. Uh-huh. So people do live here, but what they're making is that kind of Jeremy Benthamite calculation, right? That the overall usefulness of these experiments for national security is worth risking the lives and health of this relatively small number of people who live in this not very fertile place, right? And so I think a lot of what Williams is doing here is the same kind of thing that, again, that Ursula Le Guin was doing, is like kind of putting a face on oh, these abstractions. I'll just put it together. Uh -huh. <laughs> it says, um, not only were the winds blowing north, curving, low use segments of the land, all that stuff. Uh -huh. um, I think she's talking about they were dropping stuff on areas that seemed like they were low use yeah. to the actual population, but yet the population still enjoyed it and, see, and still saw that. Exactly, low use yeah. Place as home. Yeah. But because it's these, that they appreciate. yeah. But again, because these people running because, the experiments yeah, are local, they thought it wasn't useful yeah. to the population. They yeah. Just didn't care about it. Yeah. All right. Good. What about the rest? Of you? What did the rest of you choose to, to focus on here? Yeah, Brandon. I got three different books, and I okay. chose like the beginning of the whole essay where she like continuously refers to like all the people affected or all the women affected with cancer as a clan of one breast of women. Okay. Because it's like they're not actually a clan, but she's like using the word to kind of express how much people they're actually affecting and how much people are actually getting cancer from it. Yeah, let's yeah, let's stop for a minute and focus yeah, on the use of that word clan here, right? What is a clan? Yeah, and they're usually linked by what? If you're a member of a clan, how are you linked to other members of that clan? Yeah, it's a genetic relationship, right? So a clan is basically a kind of extended family group, right? Right, everybody in the clan is related to everybody else, whether through blood or through marriage, right? And do we tend to think of, the cl of a clan as a sophisticated and civilized or relatively primitive form of social organization? Yeah, it, it, it's a more kind of basic form of social organization, right? Yeah, good, okay. Okay, uh, you can go ahead and keep going, Brandon. Um, for my second one, uh -huh. I did uh, where she was talking about seeing the bombs and she was saying uh, she described it as rising from the desert for uh, we saw it clearly this golden stem cloud, like a mushroom. The sky seemed to vibrate with an eerie pink glow. Uh huh. And the way she's describing it, she describes it as if she doesn't know what it is. So it's showing like how they didn't even know that they had bombs like that, let alone that they were using it on their own soil. Yeah. And then her father says after that that mm -hmm. he knew basically. Yeah. He thought that she knew. Yeah. That, she that, yeah, she has this recurring dream where she sees this light in the sky, right? And it turns out that she's just remembering something that she saw as a very, very small child. So something that seems to her like weird and out of place, like it can't possibly have actually happened, right? Her father says, so like, no, like this was common knowledge. Like everybody saw this in the 50s, yeah. And I think we might be able to relate this as well to if there's, there is a kind of um, discourse of secrecy and cover up in this as well that we might kind of bring it back to for a second. What was, what was your third one, Brandon? What was the other, the other one you uh, threw in on? Where she says they worked their mask and they became the basis of humanity. Uh huh. I think that that's saying like she believes that the women were kind of like 
people stand up for it or like actually recognizing that the government's doing wrong or kind of representing a big mass of people. Because like the government's thinking that it's uh -huh. not affecting that much, uh, or they're affecting like a small amount of people, but the fact that they're affecting any amount of people uh -huh. needs to be represented by like a group of people. Yeah, they, 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 so yeah, they have to put on these hazmat suits, right? To go on to what they think of as their own land. And their faces are then, you know, covered or protected by these clear masks, right? So you can still see the face, right? But you can only see the face uh, through a kind of, through a window, right? Through a kind of mediator. There's something between you and the face in the mask. Now, the other thing I want to kind of go back to for a second here is this I, the, the idea of the clan of one-breasted women here, right? Is anybody familiar with the Greek myth of the Amazons? Sort of like Futurama. Okay. <laughs> I remember that episode of Futurama, yes. Death, death by Snoo Snoo, yeah. That's, mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, okay, so nobody, nobody else has ever heard of... Uh, Yeah, okay, so, and then, and then, yeah, that's drawn from Greek mythology, right? DC and Marvel Comics actually both draw a hell of a lot of stuff from Greek and Roman mythology and from Norse mythology. Um, but yeah, the Amazons, yeah, you're, are a, a tribe of female warriors. And according to Greek myth, women in the tribe amputated one of their breasts in order to be better able to draw back a bowstring to make themselves more effective warriors. That's crazy. Yeah, but that's the myth, right? Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> I think the reason that she's using this particular idea, this particular metaphor, is uh, like the clan of one-breasted women she belongs to, right? Why are they one-breasted? So they can be warriors, basically. Yeah, from yeah, they're one breasted from mastectomies, right? Oh, uh, so yeah, so they, they yeah, uh, yeah, they're they're cancer victims. Yeah, right? but yeah, they also see themselves as fighters for making it through. Yeah, and they relate themselves to that mm -hmm. for them also being fighters. Exactly, and I think that like this kind of openness about the cancer and the suffering, right? is, you know, yeah, it's about like making oneself a warrior rather than a victim. Very similar to uh, some of the arguments Audre Lorde was making last time, right, about, you know, not just being a casualty, also being a warrior, right? Okay, what else you got? Uh huh. Still born. Okay. Um, are more the Mormons believe in predestination? You know, I don't actually know whether they do or not. Is it the Presbyterians? I think yeah. Predestination specifically is um, like the Calvinist tradition of Protestant. Basically, any denomination that talks about. Um, like knowing that you're saved, like, like a, a point in your life when you know that you're saved, believes in some version of the doctrine of the elect, right? That essentially God has determined for you whether or not you're saved. And that, you know, whatever you did or, you know, equality by yourself have nothing really to do with it, right? Um, I don't think that's the case in Mormonism, but I don't really know, I don't really understand Mormon theology all that well. It doesn't really matter now because I already moved past it in my head. Okay. Um, <laughs> but what I was thinking was when she says the red hot pains beneath the desert, I thought of uh -huh. hell. Okay. And I thought, you know, as a Mormon, you know, hell is probably pretty important to them. Okay. Not going there. Right. And, the, and you know, they, I think Mormons probably would like to tie religion into government, obviously. So. Uh huh. And they say as each bond becomes a stillborn. Yeah. So. And actually, why I was thinking predestination was that point exactly. Uh -huh. If a bomb 
causes somebody to not be born. I mean, to be born but not get to that moment in their life. Yeah. And then they're, they get sent to hell, I guess. Uh huh. So. Well, I, I, I think like well, we can also think of this like a kind of hell, like boiling up under the earth, right? Like literally underneath the earth's surface, right? And um, there's a lot of birth imagery here as well, right? So in addition to like, talking about like this bubbling up and being a stillbirth, even before this, right? She's talking about the ravens watching the desert heave as though it's going through birth pangs, right? Stretch marks appeared. The land was losing its muscle. So like it's a birth, but it's a birth out of a tired, land that's done this many times before yeah. and you know the raven do we tend to associate ravens with birth do we is that what yeah no. yeah what do we know about ravens um, about their habits aren't they usually the first animals back into an area they are often among the first, yeah, they are often among the first animals back into an area that's been um, devastated, right? But there's a particular reason why. What do they eat? They eat carrion. Yeah, they eat corpses. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're scavengers. Yeah. looking for, like, dead animals or something. Yeah, so yeah, we look, we yeah, ravens, are typically associated with death and decay, right? Actually, a little bit unfairly, ravens are actually highly intelligent and socially complex birds. Is that why they hang out with witches? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah, we associate the raven, yeah, with also like with things like black magic, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because they're smart or something. And because they hang around, they hang around dead things. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely don't associate the raven with normal birth processes. Oh, uh, that's a stork. Yes. <laughs> yeah, if there was a stork hanging out here, like one, it would be weird to have a stork hanging out in the Utah desert. Yeah. But um, yeah, but the, yeah, that, that's the bird we symbolically associate with birth. Good. Yeah. 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 All right. What else? says that the Nevada or she says that the Atomic Energy Commission describes the country of North or of Nevada to uh -huh. as virtually uninhabited desert terrain. My family and the birds at Great Salt Lake were some of the virtual uninhabited. Okay, I'm gonna associate that with the whole low use thing, right? You know, it's virtually uninhabited. So again, like showing that they know that there are people there just not enough for them to care, right? Yeah, yeah she, she, she literally with what he just said, he literally said something about her talking, saying mm -hmm. something about how they are the uninhabited. Yeah, yeah. What, um, what, were you, what were you saying? And she refers to birds to like acknowledging that birds again, yeah. Mm -hmm. people don't live there, and there still has to be some type of like animal. Yeah, like, yeah there's still thing. life there. Yeah, and I think we can kind of tie that back to Rachel Carson talking about the effects of chemicals on ecosystems, right? And the way we, you know, the way we kind of short-sightedly... The untested fertilizer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, do these kinds of things for our own particular advantages. But not um, think about everything else besides us. Yeah. yeah non they're not even thinking about us. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and certainly not the non-human life that's there, yeah. All right, what else? What else you got? You guys are actually doing great at this. I did the, um, the song about the rabbits. Okay. And how they, um, they like compared themselves to the rabbits. Right? Uh -huh. that's, that's what I think it means. Okay. They, um, how they're like quiet and like they lived there too. But okay. They didn't acknowledge them. Yeah, and the, the rabbits walk gently on the earth, right? So the rabbits move upon the surface without disturbing it, right? Without making trouble. Now, what else 
do we know about rabbits, and how might we also connect that to the motherhood image? They have a lot of children. Yeah, you know, have you ever heard the phrase breed like rabbits, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, rabbits are, all, are noted for their fertility. You know, which I guess, you know, when you're a prey animal is kind of one of your best defenses against extinction. But um, yeah, yeah, the, but yeah, rabbits are assessed, yeah, both with, with motherhood and with quick and quiet movement, right? Not disturbing the environment around them. Good. Um, so yeah, there are just two things that I wanted to point out, um, and then I'll let you all go. Um, one, uh, the first animals that are noticed dead here, right? Anybody notice what they were? Sheep. Dead yeah. sheep, Dead yeah. Sheep. Does that have to do with God, back to the morning thing? Because it says, mm -hmm. um, followers? Yeah, the followers of the sheep. Yeah. The yeah, I think that, yeah, even outside of any specific religious significance, right, sheep are led by a shepherd. Yeah. They're noted for their obedience, right? You know, symbolically speaking anyway, right? Sheep are meek. They're not real bright. They're dumb. They, so they need yeah, advice. they yeah, sheep don't ask questions, right? And when they have the guidance they follow. Yeah. And that's exactly kind of the way Williams depicts, you know, even, you know, her grandmother and her mother as they're going through cancer, right? They rationalize it as a kind of spiritual experience, um, you know, that is, you know, like a kind of test, right? Yeah. Just as people rationalize these nuclear tests as being necessary for national security, even if it was giving a lot of people, you know, frankly, giving a lot of people cancer, right? So people kind of passively accepting the very thing that's making them sick and then covering up the wounds, right? I talked a little bit before about a discourse of secrecy, right? If we look on page 256, there's a paragraph that says, two days later, my father took my brothers and me to the hospital to visit her. She met us in the lobby in a wheelchair. No bandages were visible. I'll never forget her radiance, the way she held herself in a purple velvet robe and how she gathered us around her. Now what sentence here, what short sentence might relate to a kind of discourse of secrecy? Her bandages were visible, nope. so maybe there yeah. was some underneath her. Exactly. Yeah, but they were known that they could see the Yeah, see. it's hidden from the children and the husband, right? Yeah. The actual wound, the actual suffering. Yeah. Just as what's actually happening to people in the Nevada desert and in Utah. Nobody knows about it. Yeah. And then the last thing, right, she talks about, you know, following the, the Mormon word of wisdom, right? So there's a footnote to explain this, but did anybody know what this was beforehand, like what Mormon dietary habits are like? Like what sorts of things Mormons avoid? Uh, um, do they avoid like a certain kind of meat or something? They don't avoid a certain kind of meat. Um, I think you might be thinking about like Jews and Muslims. Yeah, I was about to say, I yeah. Jews. Yeah. Um, I forgot. You want to say? Well, I mean, you don't need to, no. But yeah, basically any kind of intoxicants, right? So, you know, no alcohol. Oh, yeah. Any type of. No coffee or tea, right? No drugs. Yeah, no drugs, coffee, tea, yeah. Like herbal stuff. Yeah. So it, it's, you know, like a kind of like, um, you know, it, a wholesome diet, right? Wholesome lifestyle practices. And what beverage do we usually associate with wholesomeness particularly? Is there a particular drink that, what's that? Milk. Milk, yeah. And I want to direct you to page 257. Right. It was at this moment I realized the deceit I had been living under. Children growing up in the American Southwest, drinking contaminated milk from contaminated cows, even from the contaminated breasts of their mothers, my mother. So the idea of the contaminated milk here, right, 
is and it like wholesomeness corrupted, right? Yeah. Oh dang, yeah, no, that one's way deeper. About the whole wholesomeness thing. <laughs> All right, so what I'd like y'all to maybe try to think about doing for the last response paper, right, is whatever particular text you choose, you could do it with this one, you could do it with one of the others. Try to do something like what we've just done here, right? Pick some kind of resonant image in the text. Try to pick that apart, like try to, you know, pick apart some kind of metaphorical meaning that you find in it. And, and see what you're going to do. Right? Like we did last time. Yeah, well, if any of the reflection papers oh, yeah, you can turn into the big paper. paper. Yeah. Yeah. Paper, yeah. Reflection paper and expand yeah. on it, and then that becomes mm -hmm. like a graph. And, you know, yeah, but for this last one, I want you to try to do something like this. Sure. All right, so does anybody have any questions about anything? Is this one still 500 words? Yep, still 500 right. words. Yep. Brandon, what were we going to ask? Our big paper has the argument. That's, yeah, the, exactly. Yep. All right, so everybody have yourselves a good holiday. Board yourselves on turkey and stuffing. Enjoy your families. Enjoy not having to be here.